Today we explore the awesome arpeggios and cross-picking chops of one Richard Blackmore. There, kids, it's your good buddy, Uncle Ben. Now you guys know I love getting feedback and suggestions from you all about what you'd like to see covered here on my channel, especially if it's through my Patreon page at patreon.com slash benellerguitars. And just the other day I got a question over there on Patreon from my man Casper asking how he can improve his cross picking technique. He specifically used the arpeggios in the chorus section of the rainbow song Man on the Silver Mountain as an example of a speed barrier he was trying to break through with his cross picking. In the chorus section of the song Richie is playing some three string arpeggios at 16 notes and they're being alternate picked across the strings at a tempo of about 107 BPM. For those of you guys who don't know what cross picking is, it's the technique where we utilize alternate picking going across the strings even when we're just playing one note per string. It's a really difficult technique to master especially considering that so many of the examples of players using it are just insanely hard to learn like uh, Steve Morris's cross picking in too many notes. But considering Man on the Silver Mountain is a bit more mid tempo, it's a great place to start if you're looking to improve your cross picking chops. You guys can find tabs for this lesson over on my Instagram page at Ben Elder Guitars. Just search for hashtag WeekendWankShop264, find them, and start shredding along. Downloadable tabs, backing tracks, bonus lessons, and much more are available to everybody who supports my channel over on my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Guitars. This week you're also going to get a bonus lesson showing you guys how I would attack these arpeggios using a little bit of a combination of sweep and hybrid picking, some of that Marshall Harrison style swybrid picking, I think it's what the cool kids call it. This is a way that I like to play arpeggio stuff whenever it exceeds my threshold of cross picking chops. You can access that bonus lesson and many more if you support my channel even at the $1 a month level. So be sure to click the link in the video description below and check out that Patreon page today. Thanks. Now before we start breaking those arpeggios down any further, let's hear them again at Septad speed. Let's go over just kind of the shapes and stuff like that that he's playing first, and then we'll talk about the picking technique. First arpeggio up here is this D minor, which we're gonna play on the high E string fret number five, B string six, and G string seven. There's your root note for that D minor arpeggio right there. Now basically what you're gonna do is you're just going to arpeggiate that from the high note to the low note four times in a row. So basically we're gonna pick it E, B, G, B like that four times. One, two, three, four. After this, we're gonna to switch to a B flat major arpeggio, which just involves changing one note off of here. To make a B flat major arpeggio, what you're gonna to need to do is just take that first finger and move it up one fret, so that now your arpeggio goes six, six, seven from the top to the bottom. There's your B flat. Now, some players would rather use kind of that popping and locking first finger like that, which to me works fine. If you're good at that technique, go for it. You'll want to fret the high E string kind of on your fingerprint and then shift to your fingertip whenever you go to the B string to avoid making those notes bleed over into each other like that. Myself, a lot of times whenever I'm playing these arpeggios at kind of mid tempos where I really need to lock in the groove, I kind of like the approach of using different fingers for every note rather than multitasking with my first finger like that just because it feels like there's more groove in my left hand. It's like the left hand is always going da 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 rather than kind of shifting and getting out of rhythm. So if it works, go for it. If it does it for you, use that popping and locking first finger. So we're gonna play that B flat arpeggio four times in a row as well. Before we go back to the D minor, the first one that we played also four times. 
After this, we're gonna jump up here to an A minor arpeggio. Again, same three strings, but it's gonna be eight, 10, and nine. So I'm using my first, third, and second fingers for that shape. It's kind of your familiar D minor feeling shape, just up here at the eighth position. That's your A minor arpeggio. Also gets played at four times. So, so far you've had D minor, B flat major, D minor, then jump it up to A minor. Next we're gonna go back to B flat, but it's not the same B flat that you played earlier. It's up here in a higher position with the root note on the B string instead of the high E. So the shape we're gonna use here, you know, if you're just kind of eyeballing it, you could say it looks like a D major kind of fingering, you know? But it's gonna be using frets number 10, 11, and 10 on your E, B, and G strings. Notice I'm using my first finger and kind of hopping from the high E to the G. Not, you know, barring. Whenever you bar, there's gonna be bleed. And like I said, I just like the rhythmic feeling in the left hand whenever I'm using a different finger or a different movement for every note. I just think it kind of grooves better for me anyway. So you're gonna play this B flat two times in a row. And then move up one whole step and turn it into a C arpeggio. So now we're on 12, 13, and 12. So that's two B flats, two Cs. Then you're gonna go back to B flat two more times. So this section so far is gone. And then we're gonna play a G minor. This kind of feels just like your A minor that we played earlier, just a step lower. And we're gonna be using frets number six, eight, and nine to make this G minor right here. Again, root note on the B string. So that's B flat C, B flat G minor. And then the very last part here goes to an E flat major, which again, if you just take your D shape and move up a half step, that's your E flat major arpeggio. Same shape we used up here. It's gonna be frets number three, four, and three times in a row. Then move up a whole step to an F major, which is gonna be five, six, five. Again, two times in a row. Then the lastly resolve by hitting that eighth fret B string, your G note. So all together you got D minor, B flat major, back to D minor, A minor, B flat major, C major, B flat, G minor, E flat, F, and G. Now, of course, the playing of the later neoclassical guys like Ingve is all very centered around using sweet picking to play these arpeggios, but these arpeggios that Richie's playing here are not swept. As near as I can tell. There's basically no live footage of Richie playing this. Live, they tend to play the song like 30 or 40 BPM faster than the record. So it would be pretty insane to try to cross pick that stuff at that tempo. Uh, so usually Richie doesn't play this live. But judging by the way that it sounds on the album, I would nearly bet anything that it is cross picked because it just is so rhythmic. You know, whenever we do sweet picking to play through arpeggios, it gets a very fluid sound, which is great for playing leads and things. But for stuff like this, it needs to be really in the pocket and really grooving with those, you know, eighth notes or 16th notes. Cross picking is a way that you can just get a lot more rhythmic focus in your playing and make stuff sound really tight. But just like a lot of other things that are worth learning, it's hard. So it's a really different logic than what you use whenever you're sweet picking. Sweet picking is all about like maximum efficiency. If you're hitting this string, then hitting this one, just use two upstrokes, you know? From going from here to here, two downstrokes. It's all about using like the minimal movement that you can. And cross picking isn't really about that. Again, it's not as efficient, but it's just so much groovier whenever you're playing at mid-tempo speeds like this. To me, whenever you sweep these, for one, just that kind of economy picking, sweeping motion is harder to maintain if it's not going super fast because that pick can just slip through the string so quickly. It's kind of hard to slow it down enough to where it'll stay in the groove at, you know, 107 BPM like this is. But whenever I cross pick these and I start with a downstroke, so they're always going down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. My downstroke, which is naturally bigger and heavier sounding, lands on the downbeat every time. Meanwhile, like the upstrokes are landing on the less important parts of the beat, which is gonna make this sound a little bit more dynamic and probably most importantly, keep me locked into the groove even better. 
Whenever you're cross-picking arpeggios like this, you want to avoid making your pick strokes extremely straight in the up and down direction like this. Because if I start with, you know, the high E string here and I do a down stroke and it's just straight down, well now I'm stuck under that string. In order to do an up stroke on the B here, I've got to jump up and over. I'll do an up, then I've got to jump over this to do a down and so on. That is the opposite of any kind of efficiency and it's going to be impossible to get that up to any kind of decent tempo. Instead, what your picking motions should resemble whenever you're cross picking is more like turning a key in a lock. You see, I kind of have like my whole forearm and wrist sort of twisting that way. That means that whenever I do a downstroke, it doesn't just go down and under the strings. It goes down and out and away. That way I can swing this upstroke. And again, that's going to turn as well, up and away down and away, up and away. Again, the best way I can think to describe that is like turning a key like that. I'll try to exaggerate the motions a little bit so you can really see them here in my picking hand. You can see that with every pick stroke that I make, whether it's a down or an up, the tip of the pick ends up above the strings. It ends up out and away from them. That's critical for getting this cross picking thing down. Because if you're ever stuck in between the strings, this is not going to happen. You always need to go out and away with every pick stroke, which is what, you know, again, that, that key in a lock motion just does naturally. Now, in order to aid you in getting the uh, super precise right hand movements that you need to make this work, I'm going to recommend anchoring your hand down here on the uh, unused strings of the guitar. And actually we end up muting the high strings that we are playing a little bit too. We'll talk about that in a second as well. Whenever you anchor that hand down, it kind of limits our range of motion a bit. We can no longer do these huge swings that we don't need. It kind of automatically restricts you to a smaller movement. Uh, the best thing I can think of as an example of like how you use this in your day-to-day -day life is if you think about it, whenever you're like signing your name or something like that on a piece of paper, right? you rest your hand down on it so that way your wrist can get the fine degree of movement and control that you need to make all those little squigglies, right? But whenever your arm is floating, that's when the whole arm takes over and you make huge motions. This is no different. Rest your hand on those unused strings and palm mute a little bit on the high strings as well whenever you play this and it's going to let you get the degree of control that you need to make this technique work. <laughs> Now, Richie, it sounds like on the original recording, is doing a little bit of palm muting on the strings that he's playing too, which I'm kind of getting here off the very side of my palm. That kind of serves two benefits. For one, it just sounds nice and like crispy and articulate. But the other great thing is, is whenever you're palm muting, especially those high strings, they have no sustain at all. It's like playing a banjo or something like that. There's just no sustain on them. Whenever you're playing arpeggios like this, you don't want the notes to bleed into each other, right? Again, we're not trying to do this. And uh, the cool thing is, is whenever you're kind of palm muting those strings a little bit, you can kind of just hold the whole shape down and the notes aren't going to bleed over into each other because they're just so short naturally whenever you palm mute. Another great benefit of using some light palm muting on those high strings while you play this too is that it keeps those strings from getting beaten up too much, which makes them easier targets. See, if I was to play this with no palm muting, you know, you can just look down at your strings here and see them really vibrating a lot which means that they're moving targets, you know? So they're not just static strings, they're also kind of vibrating like crazy as I'm trying to get across them like that. But whenever you palm mute, because you're killing the sustain of it, uh, it really limits how much those strings can vibrate, which means they're just kind of going to be easier to hit. Any technique I can do that makes it easier to control this hand and the strings over here is going to be a win-win. So now that you have the arpeggio shapes and a little bit of that cross-picking technique worked out, let's talk about the best way to get this up to speed and make it start feeling a little bit more natural for you. So especially if you're new to this cross-picking technique, I would not recommend practicing this by just trying to play through that entire sequence of like 150 notes and hoping you do it a little bit better every time that you go. In order to conquer this, what you need to do is to try to make that four note uh, cross picking sequence, down, up, down, up, feel like one fluid motion to you. The best kind of analog I can think of that is like whenever you play a bunch of gallops in a row, right? 
Like you're not really consciously thinking about like play that down, up, down, now play another one, now play another three notes, now play another three notes. It's more like do a gallop, now do another one, now do another one, now do another one. So you're not really thinking about every little note as it goes by. It's just kind of like do that one technique, then do it again. And how you're gonna help your brain build this four note phrase into one little block of muscle memory is by practicing it in little chunks. Notice I'm playing the four notes, then resting. Really trying to groove it, you know? Play it like a riff. That's something I'm always telling my students this stuff. Don't play this like it's a lead. Play it like it's a riff. Think groove, you know? Think about really trying to stay locked in with that stuff. And play it in a really rhythmic way. That's not like a little dainty lead part. Really try to get in there and groove with it. And like I said, play these four notes and then rest like this. You might notice there that I'm really accenting that first note of each of those groupings. That sort of serves two purposes, because for one, whenever you have that accented note on the downbeat, it just sounds really nice and locked into the groove. But from just a muscle memory standpoint, the great thing is, is by accenting that first note of each of these groups, it makes me feel the clear definition of when each one of these little chunks of muscle memory is starting, you know? It really sticks a flag in it and says it starts here, then it starts here again, then it starts here again which is what makes those motions like kind of repeatable in little chunks like that. If every note feels identical, it's easy to get lost. But whenever it's... The more I feel like that little four note sequence is just being copied and pasted by my brain over and over and over. Whereas if it's just completely not grooving, I lose track and I don't know where the start of it is. So as you practice this, just be sure to really accent that first note of each of these four note groupings. It's really gonna help you memorize that and again, internalize that four note picking sequence. What I want you to start doing next is try to get it leading around into the next four note sequence. Again, kind of taking one ring of the chain and starting to loop it around to the next ring. Whenever we do that, we're proving to our brain that it can take that one little chunk of information we just taught it and start connecting it to the next chunk that's gonna follow right on top of it. And then what I want you to do is to try to start taking one of these little four note chunks and tag it onto another one, you know? Maybe something like this. Again, whenever I play that D minor sequence four times in a row, I'm not looking at it as 16 notes that I have to nail in a row. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I'm not looking at it at, like that at all. I'm looking at it as use that four note chunk that I taught my brain how to do four times in a row. One, two, three, four. I just want you guys to remember that every chain is forged one link at a time, right? You don't forge the entire thing at once. It's gotta be one link at a time. And to form a perfect chain, you have to first make a flawless link, which is why I recommend just trying to isolate these little four note phrases and practicing those until you get them down stone cold. You'll know you've got it when it just feels like one motion. Again, just like a gallop, you know? You don't think about all three notes, you just call it a gallop and you kind of smash all three out. Same way with this. Whenever you have it down where you can just feel like you're doing one little flick of the wrist and that covers all four notes, that's when you know you've got yourself a solid link to start building your chain. Good luck with that one guys, that's a really cool one to use to learn this cross picking technique, which like I said, can be really useful no matter what style of music you're playing. Huge thanks to my man Casper for suggesting this over on my Patreon page over patreon.com slash Guitars. Thank you all so much for watching, be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for new content coming at you every single week. Well guys, I wish you luck on your cross picking quest, but as for me, it's about time to go make some lunch. And as for you, I recommend getting away from the computer, picking up your guitar, and getting to work. Less clicking, more picking.